what really caused the fall of Mozilla Firefox? After all, from its initial beta in 2002 to its peak in 2009, it played a huge role in dethroning Microsoft's browser monopoly, and has continued to be an incredibly influential browser for the internet as a whole. However, for the past 13 years, Firefox's market share has been on a slow but concerning decline. Why did this happen? This is the rise and fall of Mozilla Firefox. The year is 1992, 10 years before Firefox's release. While the internet had been around in some form for decades at this point, it was still several years away from reaching the mainstream. That year, thanks to funding from Al Gore's High Performance Computing Act from a year prior, development of one of the first and most prolific browsers began at the University of Illinois' National Center for Supercomputing Applications, or NCSA, spearheaded by Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina. While NCSA Mosaic, as it would become known, was not the first browser ever, it was the first one to gain any sort of popularity due to it being easier to use and install compared to most browsers, and having brand new features such as inline images. The first public version of Mosaic would be released for Unix systems using the X window system on January 23, 1993, and Mosaic would also be released for Windows and Macintosh computers in September of that year. Several companies licensed technologies and source code from NCSA, such as Fujitsu and Spyglass Inc. A little over a year after the release of Mosaic, Mark Andreessen, along with entrepreneur Jim Clark, would found the company that would become known as Netscape Communications Corporation, and on October 13, 1994, the first version of the Netscape Navigator browser was released. Just three months after Netscape Navigator's release, it had already taken over Mosaic as the most popular browser with the limited number of people who used the internet at the time. And as the internet grew, Netscape grew with it. Netscape was revolutionary in that it loaded websites and images as they were received from the server, meaning that on a slow dial-up connection typical back in the day, you could read the text content of websites while waiting for images to load. Netscape was available as a free download for non-commercial use as well as in-box at retail stores, and was bundled with many Windows PCs along with Mac OS 8 and 9. It was also the first browser to implement many popular web standards, such as JavaScript, Frames, and Cookies. And what started out as a web browser would eventually grow into a suite of applications. Netscape eventually rose to 80% market share. But by using their leverage in the PC market, Microsoft Internet Explorer was able to reduce Netscape to ashes. That whole story, and the antitrust case that resulted from that, is a tale from another time. In early 1998, as Netscape's user base was on a steady decline, the Mozilla organization was created to host the source code used in the Netscape application suite, under the Mozilla application suite name, and facilitate future development. Later that year, Netscape Communications Corporation was bought by AOL for $4.2 billion. AOL would continue development of the Netscape browser until its eventual discontinuation in 2008. However, the Mozilla source code would live on in another popular browser. When the Netscape application suite was made open source in 1998, the Mozilla organization was formed in order to coordinate the development of the new open source code. However, the code was messy and suffered from code rot, and the Mozilla developers wanted freedom from AOL and Netscape. For this reason, three developers from Mozilla began work on an experimental browser-only branch of the Mozilla project, known as Phoenix. The first public release of Phoenix version 0.1 was released on September 23, 2002. Phoenix 0.1 was based on the Mozilla codebase, using technology such as the XUL user interface and Gecko web engine, but was designed to be simpler to use and faster than competitors. It integrated exclusive features such as tabbed browsing, a customizable toolbar, a pop-up blocker built in, and consistency with system themes, which are all things that Mozilla Firefox still has today. The second release of Phoenix, 0.2, also included a search bar, allowing for searching the web without either having to go to the search engine website or install yet another toolbar. Citing trademark issues, the Mozilla organization was forced to change the name of Phoenix to Mozilla Firebird with version 0.6. However, the developers of the open source database software Firebird, who just so happened to have professional support offered by a company called IB Phoenix, a fact that most certainly didn't make researching this confusing at all, 
all, weren't too happy about this, citing possible confusion between the programs. Eventually, with the release of version 0.8, Mozilla changed the name to Firefox, and it has stayed that way ever since. On July 15, 2003, AOL created the Mozilla Foundation, a non-profit organization that handled development of Firefox and the legacy Mozilla suite, which would become the SeaMonkey project after Netscape's demise. AOL helped get the nonprofit off the ground by donating $2 million as an initial investment over the next two years. After over two years of development, Firefox 1.0 was officially released on November 9th, 2004. As soon as Firefox was released, its market share began to take off as people realized that the browser was considerably faster and more secure than Internet Explorer or Netscape Navigator. Just one year after its stable release, Firefox surpassed 100 million downloads and would continue to grow for many years to come. Firefox integrated many features that were not in Internet Explorer, such as a clean design, search bar, pop-up blocker, proper compliance with web standards, and an improved extensions API. As Firefox continued to grow, the Mozilla Foundation couldn't sustain itself on purely donations, so they created a taxable subsidiary known as the Mozilla Corporation. The Mozilla Corporation handles business relationships, marketing, and development of Mozilla products, but is wholly owned by the nonprofit foundation. One of the most profitable and most controversial business relationships was the Google search deal, where Google would pay Mozilla for nearly 10 years to keep Google as the default search engine in Firefox. And how much do they pay Mozilla exactly? Well over $1 billion from 2005 to 2014, or over 80% of Mozilla's total revenue, all for a single toggle in the settings of a browser. This will be controversial later. With the help of funding from Google and other sources, Firefox's development continued, and its market share continued to grow. The final few releases of Netscape were based on Firefox, and once AOL finally pulled the plug on Netscape in 2008, users were recommended to use Firefox. Even Microsoft partnered with the Mozilla Corporation on making Firefox well integrated with Windows Vista. It seemed that nothing could stop Firefox's rot- on September 2nd, 2008, Google released the first beta of their own web browser known as Chrome. On the surface, Chrome's design was very minimalistic and streamlined compared to other web browsers at the time, and thanks to the fact that Chrome loaded each page in a different process, Chrome was significantly faster than other browsers. Early versions of Chrome lacked support for browser extensions and were only available for Windows, but these issues would be sorted out in time. By the end of 2010, Google Chrome had gained nearly 15% of browser market share while Firefox's market share was slowly declining from its peak of about 32%. Towards the end of 2011, Chrome surpassed Firefox in market share, and Firefox would never return to the same amount of relevance as it had before. Firefox was redesigned in 2011 to be more modern, but simple cosmetic changes weren't enough to bring Firefox's market share up. It's now the early 2010s, aka the time where almost every company was experimenting with design of hardware and software. Some of these were successful, such as Flat Design, iOS 7, Chromebooks, and Windows 8.1. Sort of. However, many were not successful at all, such as Windows Phone, the iPhone 5C, Ubuntu Touch, and the topic of this section, Firefox OS. In 2011, Mozilla began work on Firefox OS, known at the time as Boot to Gecko, which was a Linux-based operating system for mobile devices centered around HTML5 and web technologies. They also created APIs for websites to access hardware features such as the camera and GPS, and created some native applications written in HTML5, along with an app store for downloading web applications that could run offline. Think original iPhone web apps. Thanks to web apps, applications didn't even need to be downloaded in order to be used, contributing to the OS's speed. Firefox OS was released in 2013, and was shipped on some low-end smartphones that year, as well as being the operating system of choice on some smart TVs. Firefox OS was at first relatively successful, however, after less than four years, it was discontinued by Mozilla due to lack of adoption. TechAltar made a great video going more into depth about why exactly it failed, but TLDW Firefox OS was a solution looking for a problem that the vast majority of users straight up didn't have. In 2017, Firefox OS was forked into Kyo OS, a mobile operating system for feature phones that has proven to be quite successful in developing markets, with tens of millions of devices sold. In the middle of the Firefox OS mess, Mozilla was in the middle of a fairly major controversy over their new CEO, Brendan Eich, appointed on March 24th, 2014. On paper, this guy seemed like a pretty good pick for the job. He was the creator of JavaScript, the chief financial officer at Mozilla, and had been at Mozilla since the Netscape days. However, Ike found himself in controversy when his past political donations were exposed specifically his $1,000 donation to California Proposition 8, 
a bill proposing to ban same-sex marriage in the state of California, and $2,100 to right-wing Republican Representative Tom McClintock, a supporter of Proposition 8. Following this, some Mozilla employees would resign or make public statements against the CEO choice. Developers Hampton Catlin and his husband Michael Catlin, who got married in California, pulled their apps from Firefox OS, and the dating site OkCupid let users know of their CEO's donations. Ike would make a statement to his personal blog two days after his appointment, where he didn't exactly admit to what he actually did, instead opting to just say that there are concerns about his commitment to fostering equality and welcome for LGBT individuals at Mozilla, and that he would be inclusive and whatnot. However, it is unknown whether he would have followed through with these promises as just 11 days after becoming CEO, Brendan Ike would step down. This obviously led to even more controversy, but I think I think I'm going to end it here. In November 2014, Mozilla signed a deal with Yahoo in order to make Yahoo Search the default search engine in Firefox for the next five years in the US. This was part of an attempt to move away from Mozilla's reliance on Google for most of their revenue. This partnership would be terminated early in 2017, and Google would again pay Mozilla to be the default search engine starting with Firefox 57. Firefox finally surpassed Internet Explorer in market share in January of 2016 when both browsers were about 16% market share. In April of 2016, after years of neglecting their desktop browser, Mozilla began work on a project to modernize the Gecko engine and Firefox browser known as Quantum. Project Quantum was started to address some major issues with the Gecko rendering engine, such as its speed and stability. Mozilla had already been working on their experimental Servo engine, a browser engine written in Rust, that was designed to deal with these issues. However, due to the complications of writing a browser engine from the ground up, Project Quantum was created to implement some features of Servo into the existing Gecko engine, specifically improved GPU compositing with web render, support for web assembly, faster CSS, and finally, multi-threading allowing for a much faster and more stable browser than previously. Firefox 57, released on November 14th, 2017, was the first release of Firefox that implemented Quantum features. Along with the improvements under the hood, Firefox Quantum was redesigned to look significantly more modern as well. However, while Firefox Quantum was received well, its introduction didn't even make a dent on Firefox's market share, with it continuing to fall throughout 2017 and 2018. After Firefox Quantum's release, Firefox continued to receive regular bug fix and security updates throughout the next few years. However, the elephant was still in the room. That being the fact that 90% of Mozilla's revenue, or over $400 million a year, came from the deal made with Google to make it the default search engine in Firefox. Mozilla tried to diversify their brand from 2017 to 2019 with Firefox Send, a temporary file sending service much like WeTransfer, Firefox Monitor, a service that notifies users when their emails and passwords were in a security breach, Firefox Relay, a disposable email and phone service, Mozilla VPN, a VPN service, and a few others. Many of these services would be shut down in 2020, and none would be particularly successful for Mozilla. In August 2020, as Firefox's market share continued to drop, Mozilla laid off over 250 staff, citing the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Throughout the next three years up to today, Firefox has continued to receive regular updates, but besides a small boost in users in early 2022, Firefox has continued to decline during this time. Mozilla's random user interface changes that, I'm just gonna say it, no one asked for, such as the Mega Bar and slightly redesigned Proton user interface didn't help anything, and continued to drive users that didn't like them away from Firefox. Mozilla doesn't seem to be listening, all that well anyways, to what the community wants, and based on their market share being at a near all-time low as of 2023, it doesn't seem to be going very well for them. As of now, I still use Firefox. I like the fact that website dark mode works automatically when using dark GTK themes on Linux, something that Chromium-based browsers don't support. The scroll speed on X11 when using a mouse is also reasonable and not way too slow like in Chromium-based browsers and applications. I, along with many others, also do not like the idea of a single browser engine essentially controlling the entire market, which is yet another reason why I use Firefox instead of a Chromium-based browser. I hope that Mozilla can focus more on making their browser better in the next 10 years instead of implementing UI changes that pretty much no one asks for or wants. I also hope that Mozilla can break free of their partnership with Google and figure out a sustainable revenue source that isn't displaying advertised articles on the new tab page. It's time to answer the question posed at the start of this video. What caused the downfall of Firefox? 
a lot of things. Google and Microsoft's aggressive marketing of Chrome and Edge definitely contributed to the lack of market share, but I'd argue the complete standstill that made Firefox essentially pointless to use for most people from 2010 to 2017 was a bigger factor. While Google Chrome was growing, Mozilla was working on projects that never really materialized in the way that they wanted, such as Servo and Firefox OS, instead of focusing on their desktop browser. When Firefox Quantum came out, it was too little too late for most people, and Mozilla's weird and, let's just say it, uncalled for design changes in the past two or three years definitely hasn't helped. However, Firefox's existence as a separate browser engine is extremely important, and the complete death of Firefox would result in Google having an all but monopoly on non-iOS browsers, just like Microsoft had in the 90s. Mozilla should listen more to the community's feedback in order to make their browser actually better. That's about it for this video. If you enjoyed it, maybe you'd also enjoy this video about the history of the other two common browser engines on the market, and their common origin of the Conqueror browser from KDE. It's a really awesome story, and I'd recommend giving it a watch. Let me know down in the comments about your experiences with Firefox. Thank you guys so much for 600, 700, and 800 subscribers. I don't know where you guys are all coming from, but you're awesome. As always, the sources for this video, along with my Twitter, Discord, and Mastodon accounts, are linked in the description of this video if you want to follow me there. Thanks everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the future.